is an open question and a difficult question. I will not attempt any answers today, although it should be noted that the EU institutions do already, in general, achieve high standards in terms of transparency and ethics. Nonetheless, I have opened an inquiry as a form of mapping exercise to see whether those already high standards could be improved. This was prompted by concerns expressed across many sectors about a perceived lack of transparency in the process. My inquiry can be understood as an effort to facilitate a discussion about how trilogues can be made more transparent, but also about where non-disclosure of documents needs to be maintained. I will engage in this discussion with an open mind, and I hope that all stakeholders will do likewise. I also anticipate that as greater scrutiny and awareness of EU lawmaking becomes inevitable, I am likely to receive more transparency complaints in this area. By looking at the issue systemically, I hope, therefore, to limit that as much as possible. As European Ombudsman, I try to assist the institutions in ensuring that the work that they do is carried out as transparently as possible. In this work, I am guided by the treaty provisions on transparency, the fundamental right of public access to documents as contained in the Charter, as well as Regulation 1049, which gives effect to the rights as regards documents held by the Parliament, Council and Commission. In this context, I am conscious of the very special importance that obtaining access to documents relating to the adoption of EU legislation can have for citizens in a democratic legal order, such as the EU. Openness contributes to strengthening democracy by allowing citizens to follow and understand the institution's decision-making process in legislative procedures. Citizens are entitled to scrutinise all relevant decisions which have formed the basis of a particular legislative act. Citizens are entitled to hold their representatives accountable for their performance during a legislative process. This requires, obviously, knowledge and understanding of the various considerations underpinning legislation which will affect their lives. And this is arguably all the more important in the EU context given the distance that EU citizens already feel from the centre where decisions are made about them. Euroscepticism is enabled by lack of knowledge or understanding and the reaction frequently is suspicion and even hostility. The arguments in favour of granting wider access to documents where the institutions are acting in their legislative capacity are particularly compelling and put eloquently by Advocate General Kruth Bilalion in his opinion in the Access Info Europe case as follows. Lawmaking is an activity, he says, that in a democratic society can only occur through the use of a procedure that is public in nature and in that sense transparent. Otherwise, he continues, it would not be possible to ascribe to law the virtue of being the expression of the will of those that must obey it which is the very foundation of its legitimacy as an indisputable edict. The Commission has made what I would call the business case for greater transparency in its communication on better regulation published in May. It said, opening up policy making ensures that policies are based on the best available evidence and makes them more effective. The Commission adds that, particularly in the final stages of negotiations, deals are found without taking full account of the direct and indirect impacts that compromise amendments may trigger. As Malcolm Harbour and members of this European Parliament know best, it can also be said that facilitating a public debate about draft legislation proposed by the Commission that is at times contentious, controversial and complex can only be good for democracy. At the same time, I am very mindful of the need to preserve, quote, the effectiveness of the institution's decision-making process as the legislature put it in Regulation 1049 on public access to documents. I am also mindful of the fact that the EU is a representative democracy, where elected representatives are given the responsibility and privilege to negotiate with each other on the content of legislation. It is important that these politicians be allowed to do their job as elected representatives. To give one simple analogy, it would be contrary to the very essence of representative democracy if third parties 
wishing to participate directly in a parliamentary debate were to interrupt their elected representatives taking part in that debate. There is always, in a representative democracy, a privileged space for debate reserved to elected representatives. But how does that principle translate in the context of trilogues? This morning's discussion will hopefully begin to suggest some answers. In the end, of course, as Ombudsman, I make recommendations only. It will be up to the democratically elected MEPs, to the Member States and the Council, and to the Commission, in accordance with the respective roles under the treaties, to determine to what extent they make public documents related to, to, they make public documents related to trilogues. They are examining this issue in their discussions aimed at reaching a new interinstitutional agreement on better regulation, and I welcome and encourage these efforts. I am in this context very mindful of the specific role that I have been elected by Parliament to fulfil under the Treaty and under the Charter. The European Ombudsman is expected to, within its mandate, support our emerging European citizenship. Transparency, democratic accountability and public trust are central to that citizenship. 49, which specifically mandates the Ombudsman to examine issues of public access to documents in the possession of the three main institutions, itself puts greater emphasis on the transparency of the legislative process. As regards this particular inquiry, we are in the early days. I have described this first phase as a mapping exercise, which should allow my office, as an independent institution, to identify the documents relating to trilogues and obtain a full overview of them. The institution's opinions that we hope to receive soon will complement this mapping exercise. Without the genuine and constructive input from those within the institutions who work to support the trilogues process on a daily basis, I will not be able to offer constructive recommendations for improvement. I also welcome, of course, any input from members of parliament or representatives of the member states. And then also I hope to receive many responses to the public consultation that we will subsequently launch. I would like to use this opportunity to invite all of you, not only to voice your thoughts today, but also to participate in this process. Then and only then will I be able to take a well-informed position on this issue and make constructive recommendations. I think, however, that it is useful to state already now that my inquiry does not seek to bring about full disclosure of each and every document related in some way to the process. That would, be helpful, that, would be helpful and is not, that would not be helpful and is not what the law provides for. The inquiry does not aim at ensuring that absolutely everything discussed in trilogues be documented, written down or otherwise noted. The inquiry also does not seek to shape how trilogues are organised. If negotiators want to deliberate with 3, 30 or 300 participants in the room, even at 3 o'clock in the morning, that is not my concern. It is up to the democratically elected MEPs, to the member states in the Council and to the Commission to determine how they organise themselves. As I have emphasised already, I am on a transparency fact-finding mission and I have an open mind. And today I hope to learn from you on some of these matters. For example, at what stage of the process could certain documents be released, if at all? Could increased transparency concerning trilogues actually prove harmful to the trilogue process? Is there a risk that greater transparency at the wrong time will simply provide greater lobbying opportunities for well-resourced private interests to the detriment of the average citizens? Or slow down the process or bring it to a halt entirely in some cases? To what extent is it even possible to put forward useful suggestions in relation to trilogues, given that they involve an ad hoc process which can vary from trilogue to trilogue, depending on the parliamentary committee, the council presidency, or even the Commission DG involved? Is the lack of transparency more apparent than real? Does the appearance of limited transparency stem from the fact that the three institutions separately publish relevant information and documents relating to what is, very often, a necessarily a complex process? Would a single online portal containing information about the EU legislative process enable citizens to obtain access to legislative documents and to understand them better? What difference can technology make? Over the summer, the European Data Protection Supervisor developed its own smartphone application to allow interested members of the public to follow developments in the ongoing data protection reform debate. Is there potential there? These are only some of the possible questions to be asked. 
I'm sure that you will identify more, and I'm sure the panel will also have some excellent contributions, and I greatly look forward to the discussion. Ultimately, I hope we can agree that there are possible improvements to the trilogue process. Hopefully, we can agree that while the EU legislative machine works successfully agreeing complex legislation, that in the end is a question of public trust. Given events in Europe in recent years, we all know that public trust in the European Union is more important than ever. So thank you all again for attending in such numbers. Um, and um, I'll now hand over to James, our moderator. Thank you very much, James. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm afraid that the first thing we're going to do is a bit of audience participation. So, uh, could we have a show of hands, please? Who here knows what a trilogue is? Okay, that's almost everyone. Um, and who has actually been in one? About ooh, 20? 20 out of maybe 200 people? Okay, so well, we're very lucky to have uh, Malcolm Harbour with us, who has been in many, many trilogues, haven't you, Malcolm? Well, Chad, you. you've chaired them as well. So, what, what's it like? Uh, well, it's, um, it, it can be um, long and frustrating. Um, on the other hand, it is um, an essential part of the current lawmaking process. Uh, in terms of reaching an alignment between the position of the directly elected parliament um, and the position of the 28 member states. Uh, and I think that, that uh, th this crucial aspect is, has, is evident in every single piece of legislation that's passed. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on trilogue transparency in recent years because of the, of the move, the clustering towards first reading agreements, uh, uh, something we may come back to later. Uh, but in, in my first five years, where it was about half and half, first and second reading, we still had trilogues at the second reading stage. I mean, they, they, were, they were always the final part of that agreement. Um, now, I mean, given that the structure of the way that 28 member states work is entirely different from the open process in Parliament, um, you know, the, the trilogue negotiations are a very different form of negotiation. This is not politicians negotiating with politicians. It's politicians negotiating essentially with one diplomat, uh, the president in office, who represents all the 28 member states. Um, and so the dynamic of the trilogue, uh, in many cases, is about trying to understand the parliament putting pressure on the member states to understand what their objections are to parliament's position uh, and, and wanting some justification for that and often from the diplomatic side, saying, well, I, I think we've, we understand the Parliament's position. I'm happy to go and put that to the 28 member states to agree. In other words, you don't necessarily get an immediate feedback. Uh, and that's perhaps part of the frustrating element, but you can run with it. Um, so, so that's what it's like. And I mean, sometimes, you know, they go on. I've, I'm fortunate that I've never been into an all-night um, negotiation. Uh, there is always uh, a lot of time for timeouts, as in any negotiation, uh, where you see if you can make some progress. The European Commission is ever present there to try and help resolve a compromise. But in that sense, those of you that have been involved in any major negotiations on, on a big contract or something, I mean, it is that sort of process. It is a negotiating process. So the final point I would say is that I learned a huge amount before I came to this parliament, because I'm perhaps one of the few chairman of committees who actually went on a, a course to learn about the basic principles of negotiation, which I brought into practice when I was chairman of a committee. And chairing a trilogue is very different from being an active participant in it. You know, the shadow rapporteur presents his case. It was my job as the chairman to sustain the position of my committee um, whether I agree with it or not was a different matter. My job was to sustain Parliament's position, to deploy all the political resources I had, because as far as I'm concerned, all the shadow rapporteurs need to be present at the trilogue, so you get political buy-in, and then to try and make advance to understand why Parliament's position wasn't being accepted by member states, what member states' concerns were, and if necessary, we de to deploy the Commission then to help us build a compromise. Uh, and it's that sort of core approach, I think, that 
enabled my, in my term there to us uh, to make some serious progress in I think making agreements that were accepted by Parliament and have generally been well received outside. Yeah, thank you, Malcolm. That's that's interesting, but um, it actually sounds like a very organised process. But, I mean, there's a lot of people who think that the whole trilogue system is just very ad hoc. I mean, is that not your experience? No, I think it's quite the opposite. I mean, there are very formal guidelines for how um, negotiations should work. I mean, essentially, we have, you know, there's a, a clear opening position. The first of all, um, first of all, the parliament has to, and parliamentary committees have to agree, and it has to be at a committee level, this is not... Uh, delegated to the rapporteur, um, and, and this is in Parliament's rules of procedure. So I'm just saying how I approached it, and I think my colleagues would do the same. Um, so let's say we'd reached the stage in in, um, in a dossier, and particularly we were particularly sensitive about first readings, because then we wouldn't get another chance to. So the rapporteur would come to the committee coordinators, the leaders of the political fractions on the committee, and say to us, this is why I think we are now ready as a committee. I recommend to you that we open negotiations. And, and the, basically, the, the principal criteria for that is that our position as a committee was sufficiently well aligned with the position of the council that we felt we could make progress on achieving a satisfactory outcome that wouldn't undermine Parliament's fundamental requirements from that dossier. That, I think, is very important. I'm not sure that's always been kept to in many cases, but, but that, that for me is the, is the critical test, first of all. Then once we've reached agreement, then we sit down with the, the council side, because of it, it, generally it's the, council, it's the council that will make the offer to Parliament. Um, and then we would sit down and organise a series of dates, because you then have to make provision for trialogues. You have to have the interpretations necessary, you have to have the facilities, you have to have all the people there. So that in a very big negotiation, and let's take public procurement, for example, where we were dealing with three texts, each of more than 200 pages, which we ran together, um, then, then we had a, a, calendar, a forward calendar of dates when we would meet together in trialogues, and they all had to be planned in advance. Uh, they would be preceded by technical meetings between our professional staff, the staff of the committee, the, the, the staff of the council uh, and the commission, because there are always a lot of technical issues that need to be resolved. Uh, because in many cases, member states have different views about how things should be worded, um, or particular technical issues that need to be taken into account. Um, and those are not fundamental political issues or political principles. So there, is a, there are hours and hours of work to prepare trialogues to get the technical issues on the table, um, and so the first part of the trial will be to sign off the technical issues, and then you get to the meat of the discussion. And, and I, as the chairman, would agree in advance with the council what are the issues that are going to be on the table for that particular trial. Um, and, my, and we would have a preparatory meeting with my team just to decide how we're going to advance that issue, of what we were prepared to concede on, and I imagine the council have the same. So this is a very well-organized process. Um, and... Uh, and people who, who think otherwise, I think, have not really had that internal experience. But, of course, we'll come in on the questions about which documents are relevant and how to make the process more transparent, which I am very much in favour of, by the way, uh, when we get into the discussion. Okay. Thank you, Malcolm. Alberta, could you tell us a little bit about how the whole trilogue process evolved? As a little bit of historical background. Yeah, certainly. Well, as you know, as you know well... Uh, trialogues, in principle, do not, do not exist, and they have never existed. But, but of course, this is, this is not true. But, of course, this kind of informality surrounding the trialogues over time, especially in the early days, makes the task of reconstructing their origin particularly difficult. But let's say that, um, as it is often the case in the European Union, trialogues uh, emerge out of need. They need to create a parallel informal dialogue among three institutions that in our constitutional system, which is a bit peculiar with the European Commission proposing and two colleges, colleges later that had to somehow agree less in the past than today. Now they really have to agree under ordinary procedure. In the old days they, had, they didn't have to. Uh, there was felt this need to create a sort of inter-institutional forum. 
And this was the case in the 80s around the budgetary procedures where the three institutions really felt the need to create these channels of participation and cooperation among them. The idea is to informalize the process in order to reduce transaction costs and possibly speed up the adoption of a particular agreement. But the birth of the trialogues as we know them today is pretty much linked to the entry into force of the Amsterdam Treaty. And in particular to the idea according to which the Council may adopt uh, in one go uh, at first reading uh, the proposal uh, that has been amended by the Parliament. This provision created a space, a space that the institutions wanted to occupy with the trialogues and trying to possibly uh, come up with uh, a, an agreement. And as you know, around 70-80% of legislative proposals today, they are adopted uh, through uh, trialogues at the end of the first reading. So the trialogues are crucial in uh, making this increase of adoption at first reading uh, over time. But of course there has been an evolution, uh, as we have heard uh, from Michael Harbour and, and from James. Um, so we can no longer say that trialogues do not exist. If you do a URLEX search, 318 entries are going to pop out to your screen. There are a lot of informal documents, including the rules of procedure of the Parliament, to mention uh, trialogues. So trialogues exist. Even the Court of Justice has been confronted to assess the existence of trialogues in a recent case on the right of the Commission to withdraw uh, its, its proposals. And they are dealt also by all institutions for practical reasons. As you have heard, we need to organize those meetings. We need to decide where to organize them, what kind of budget are going to cover the different costs involved. So there's also a logistical challenge that makes those uh, institutional, these institutional gatherings uh, come to exist. And what is even more interesting is that we assist even right now to the emergence of new forms of trialogues. There are people in town calling uh, now uh, a particular uh, form of trialogue, quadrilogue, when it's not the Commission but is, for instance, the Court of Justice to propose legislation, we might have a quadrilogue. That's what we're witnessing with the reform, the ongoing reform of the Court of Justice. And if you look at the proposal of the interinstitutional agreement on better regulation that has been mentioned by the Ombudsman earlier on, you will see also new forms of interinstitutional cooperation. Let's think about the ad hoc panel uh, that might be established on examining the quality of the impact assessment on the amendments of the Commission proposal. These are new forms of international cooperation, and one of the open questions uh, in this institutionalization of trialogues is how this institutional mechanism will be uh, accommodated within the practice of dialogues, because this is a missing link in the current proposal for interinstitutional uh, agreement on, on better re regulation. At the same time, final point, uh, we shouldn't think about uh, trialogues as, as a monolith. It is true that there has been proceduralization, institutionalization, but they, they can actually occur at different stages, at different levels of the procedure, so different levels of representation. And this, of course, makes the understanding of the phenomenon even more difficult to capture in the all, all is evolution. James, just... Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's very interesting. To, you reminded me that this is, of course, a, an informal trialogue. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, what it, that, that, that's what we're entering into. But I just want to correct you because you said that legislation was adopted through trialogues. It's not. Of course. It's preparation of legislation to go for adoption to the Parliament. And I mean, there have been cases, it's true that in most cases, if the committee's done its work well, it will be adopted by Parliament. But there have been cases where Parliament has, has amended um, a, 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 a position agreed in trialogue, which has meant that the, that the legislation has fallen. For example, the telecoms package in 2009 before the election. Then, of course, the trialogue was then resumed after the election to uh, then to reach a final agreement. But that's a very, very important point. I, I and, and I think the Absolutely. issue about transparency comes back to whether MEPs who are not on the committee are well informed about what is in that agreement. And um, I think that uh, the Ombudsman referred to about an in, a good, very good initiative by the General Data Protection Direct, uh, Direct, uh, uh, Controller uh, to produce a report on that. And I know this is something that the European Parliament Research Services, and I don't speak for them, but I support this, will, are looking at ways to give a running report on the progress of trialogues for all members of Parliament to see, so that the adoption is not necessarily a foregone conclusion. I, I, I agree. I certainly agree on this. Formally speaking, uh, we need 
the formal adoption by, by the Parliament, and we know that the Parliament is, is basically adapting its own amendments in order to align it to this uh, agreement which has been reached. So there is a process of adoption, but as you know, statistically, it's not very significant the number of instances in which the Parliament and not the MEPs, they depart from the position which has been agreed. So in the literature, we talk about rubber stamping of the trial decision. Most of the time is is, is a rubber stamping. And this raises and opens a Pandora's box of the impact of trialogues on, on the issue of political representation and political control of the trialogue by the other MEPs, those who do, do not really have the chance to be part of the process, uh, at least until, until the very end. Can I, can I come back to you. I mean, I think this is a very emotional phrase that you use, it's called rubber stamping. Um, if the Parliament Committee has done its work properly in the first place, then it will have aligned its position. I mean, the political groups will make position. The political groups are the key people in this parliament um, who will have adopted positions um, on a proposal. Let's take public procurement, very complex and quite politically controversial. And the political groups will discuss that in quite large meetings with all their members before they vote on it. And then if they decide that the committee has done a good job of work beforehand, then they will adopt it. Now, I mean, rubber stamping implies that you just get paper out of an in-tray, you have a look at it, and you stamp it and pass it on. It completely, if you use that phrase, and I'm sorry to have a go at you about this, because I've heard this before so many times, it completely undermines the position of those of us who've done extensive work. And in the case of my committee, if I take public procurement as an example, I mean, my committee started work on public procurement in 2009 with an own initiative report, knowing that we would get draft legislation in 2012. We did two and a half years of work and preparatory work before it came to us. And not surprisingly, um, because the Commission listened to what we said, that the proposal when it came to us already had reflected quite a lot of our political priorities. And I don't think that you can consider transparency of documents separately from changing the political process. Um, and I don't think that the Commission's current proposals on better regulation also allow for that either. Yoga, quick question for you. Is the current system of trilogues open to abuse? I think when we talk about the current system of trilogues, <clears throat> to me that means primarily the radically increased number of first reading agreements and the use of trilogues very, very early on in the legislative process. And that is a problem, as far as I can see, because overall, secrecy is a threat to democracy. The European decision-making system, foreseeing up to two readings, plenary readings, uh, uh, plenary votes, two readings and pl two plenary votes in Parliament, gives some publicity and some space for scrutiny of the process. And on the big dossiers, you need that kind of time and that kind of public process to ensure that people outside of Brussels hear about some of the major legislative initiatives, have a chance, if they have expertise or if they are concerned, to get active and to organize themselves and possibly to bring in some of their viewpoints to the attention of the, representative, uh, elect, uh, of the uh, elected representatives. Now, if you shorten that whole process, and this is the preferred option of the European Commission for the last couple of years, if you shorten that process and try to have most pieces of legislation agreed before a first reading in Parliament, then really it's very, very difficult for interested and informed people to, to get active. Um, and so I see that there is a fundamental tension <clears throat> between the very clear objection, uh, um, objective of the European Commission primarily to get things done fast once they have made their proposal, because they take the time to make their proposal, but then they'd like things to go fast, and uh, the public interest to make sure that the laws that we get are of good quality, which means that they have been checked and balanced from different sides and that alternative viewpoints have been heard and have been considered. And so in that sense, it is a threat to democracy and that there's a risk of abuse, yes. Malcolm, I'm going to come to you quickly. Uh, 
I mean, do you think that the trilogue system is a threat, threat to democracy? Um, no, I don't if it's properly managed. Uh, but I do agree with Yogo that, I mean, I, since I, I was here for 15 years and I've seen this whole transition towards first reading agreements, um, uh, and, and I've worked on both, uh, and, and I agree with him that I think that uh, for some reason we, the, the, the Commission somehow thinks uh, that it, will, it will get a faster result if it goes for first reading. That's not actually proven to be the case. Um, and in some cases, you know, the second reading is a better option. Uh, and a lot of the, the issue lies actually with the Council and with the Member States. Uh, you know, I think the, the Member States could easily call time on a first reading negotiation and push it into a second reading. And they ought to use that power much earlier. Uh, because it means them, then if, if there's clearly no agreement on first reading. For example, I mean, the General Data Protection Regulation uh, I mean, that was very active when I was chairman. I mean, my committee did an opinion on it in 2012, and we still don't have agreement. Um, I think if it had gone into second reading, we might now have a text on the table, which we're now debating, and we will have more chance to examine it. I mean, as far as abuse is concerned, I mean, that really depends on how the process is run. But, I mean, the point is that, in the end, the proposal has to come to the European Parliament to be agreed. And one of the things that's happened... Um, over the last five years under the Rules of Procedure of Parliament um, is that in terms of timing, if, if you have a first reading uh, package that is going to Parliament, you now have to allow sufficient time for proper consultation with all the political groups of the Parliament so they have time to look at it and prepare their view before it goes to a vote, which actually didn't happen before. Um, but my closing point is to remind you that actually we have a three reading procedure um, because people have forgotten about the fact that we have a formalized conciliation procedure, which is essentially a formalized trialogue. Um, and, and I've been th into very few of those, because in principle I don't think it's necessary we should be able to do it in two readings. But we do have a formalized trialogue process, which is very formally organized, uh, and with all the documentation prepared and so on. So, I mean, that, that is always there to try and close things. And that, of course, is, is how we decide the budget. Um, and so whether you think the budget process is, is very transparent and open because it's run in trialogue, um, I would be interested to hear your views on that because I'm not directly involved. Vicky, this all sounds a little bit too complicated, doesn't it? I mean, we have these trilogues, we have quadrilogues. I mean, how are normal, normal people outside of a Brussels bubble meant to feel any kind of connection to these processes? Well, it's been mentioned uh, on a couple of occasions also in the introductory statement by, by Mrs. O'Reilly Ombudsman. Um, I think in legal terms you have a very strong um, adage, which is justice must not, only be seen, must, not only be seen to be, must not only be done, but must also be seen to be done. And I think the same goes very much for lawmaking. Lawmaking must not only be done, and then we come to the efficiency of doing it, which I think is definitely a plus when we're talking about trialogues, but it must also be seen to be done. And I think you rightly refer to it, Mrs. O'Reilly, that the bar must even be higher at European level than it is at national level. Because quite simply, at European level, the EU um, intervenes and legislates on the basis of, and it's legally not the right word, on a delegation of power, delegation of competence by member states. So when it is entitled to legislate, it is all the more important um, to see lawmaking to be done. Um, if you go into what the advantages are of, of, of having trilogues, I, I think there are a number of them. And I think it's um, pretty clear that with an EU of 28 member states, if you do not have the tool of a trilogue, it's quite simply um, impossible or near impossible to reach any type of agreement. And I think it's only fair to also say that every legal system has a formal process and an informal process next to it. I do only wish to make the point that I think at EU level, because the distance to the citizen is bigger, that bar needs to be higher. And the main issues there are not, I would say, of organizing trilogues, which I would say personally I'm in favor of. It's how they're organized and the systematic nature of their organization. I think at a certain point in history, Alberto, you will probably be able to comment on that better than I can, um, 
one would ask the question of do we need to organize a trilogue? <clears throat> that question is no longer asked. The question isn't asked. Trilogues are just part of the process. And I think it would be useful if we are serious about getting more transparency, getting a system of trilogues that makes sense, to ask the question if we don't need to give that a bit more thought. Another point, but I'm hopefully uh, have the time to come back to that a little bit later on, is also the question about, yes, it is a trilogue, but what should be the role of the European Commission in a trilogue? Again, I'm not going to elaborate on this now, but I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to come back to that. Uh, I think we certainly will be discussing the role of the Commission, and I, I can see you straining at the leash to discuss that, Malcolm. Um, what... And the role of Parliaments as well, please, Member Parliaments. Okay, well, why don't you go ahead now? Uh, well, I think, I, I mean, I, I'm very pleased that the sort of discussion is opening up, um, as I said earlier, into looking at the whole process and, and where the real issues are. And I think, I mean, hopefully we are, I agree entirely, as you've already said, to what, what Vicky, at the point that she made about the formal organization of trilogues, which effectively already happens. Um, but I think, uh, coming back to this first and second reading point and, and just the work that I'm, I've been involved with, uh, if you are going to have a process of first reading agreements, then in my view that only works properly if you have a proper preceding process of strategic examination and, consul and consultation on what you're going to lead into that first reading proposal. Now, as I said, when, when, I, I think I, when I was the chairman of the committee, we broke a bit of new ground that others are following to have a look at the forward program where we were expecting legislative proposals from the Commission um, so that we could do preparatory work on that proposal. Um, and I would like the Commission to formalize that um, and to agree that on major proposals they should produce a much more comprehensive set of strategic options, a green paper, if you like, for proper consultation. Um, that's not in, uh, in the, in the so-called uh, better regulation or whatever the proposal is from, uh, from Vice President Timmermans, and I think it should be. And interesting, interestingly, it was something that was called for by the Court of Auditors when they examined impact assessments, uh, I think about six or seven years ago, and I think they're also having a look at it as well. Uh, and I think that's something that I would definitely call, call to, happen, to happen. The other thing is that if we use that process properly, it's a time to engage national politicians and regional politicians in the process at a time when they can actually influence the outcome. The problem is once you get into the detailed scrutiny of a very complex technical proposal, it's not of huge interest for national, parliamentation, uh, national parliamentarians to get involved. And the big democratic deficit in, in the whole of the Commission process is that we don't get really strong engagement among national parliaments. Some are much better than others. Um, if you want to have a look at a very useful reference study, the Centre for European Reform in the United Kingdom has recently published a paper comparing the performance of the UK House of Commons with other legislatures. Uh, and that, I think, is crucially important and needs to be properly allowed for. Uh, I tried that by inviting national parliamentarians to come to the committee, for example, on public procurement, to talk about their concerns with it before we got the hold of the legislation. Um, the role of the Commission is a, is a very interesting one. The Commission is the one institution that goes to both the negotiations in Council um, and, uh, to the, and, and sits in Parliament and goes to the trial logs. Why? Sorry to interrupt you, but why are they even allowed in the room? I mean, we've got the two co-legislators, Parliament and Council. Surely they're big boys, if you like. They can sort this out. They don't need the and Commission girls. holding their hand. And girls. Sorry. Well, I mean, they don't, <laughs> the, the, commission only, uh, the Commission only intervenes when invited to by the chairman. You know, the dynamics of, of negotiations are important. On really big ticket occasions that I've been to occasion where the Commissioner uh, in person has been there, then the dynamics are that Parliament and Council sit opposite each other and the Commission sits to one side. And the Commissioner intervenes if they indicate to the Chairman that they want to speak. You know, let's be clear. You know, the decision is made. It's co-decision. It's not try-decision. Um, so it's Parliament and Council make the decision. But it's the Commission's proposal. And the Commission has made the proposal because of its expertise and its position. Um, and the Commission can contribute if there are issues between Parliament and Council where some sort of compromise, idea, or alternative can be evolved. 
And so they have a very important effect in, in uh, not such in conciliation, but in providing expert advice to help broker a, that crucial compromise. Okay. Yoga. Yeah, I'm very concerned about the, the role that the Commission plays um, if we're thinking of trilogues and the threat that it presents to public scrutiny and, and the quality of, of lawmaking, because to me it looks as if at the moment, but I'd be interested to also hear from the 20 or so people in the room who, who have been personally involved in trilogues, but from the outside perspective, it seems to me that the three players in the room do not at all hold the same kind of cards, and that the Commission, exactly because it is the only player who knows what what is the commission? The commission is everywhere. The commission is in the committees in Parliament and sees exactly how the forces are and how strong the rapporteurs, you know, what kind of backing she has. The, com the commission is in the, mem in the council working groups and sees exactly what the member states are saying. Nobody else has that information, and the commission can use that to its advantage. And if the trilogue comes early, and as I've said before, my concern is primarily about the, the, the very early use of trilogues before we have had plenary votes, um, then the Commission uses that to its advantage to basically skew it again in favor of its proposal, which is the one that is being debated there. So I think um, the – yeah, I'd be interested to hear what people say. From the outside, it looks to me that I can understand why the Commission likes it, because actually they're the most powerful player around the table. And that's not in the, in the public interest, I think, when so often we have Commission proposals that are clearly – uh, have not yet been fully looked at from all sides and which, which tend to reflect rather some you know, well-organized interest in Brussels more than the broader public interest in Europe. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sandra, and then we'll yes. come to uh, A quick point on, on what is the role and what should be the role of the European Commission in, in a trialogue. The role of the Commission in the legislative process does not end with the exercise of the right of a legislative initiative. And this is something that we, we all need to be aware of. But at the same time, the role the Commission plays during the legislative process cannot be tantamount to that of a co-legislator. It cannot be a co-legislator. It's something in between. This, the Commission proposes. It follows technically, as mentioned by Michael Harbour, the proposal for technical reasons. But at the same time, there's a further reason, the real rationale for why explaining why the Commission has to be part of the process. And this is the fact that the Commission is the custodian of the general interest. It's the only one that can pursue and defend that proposal all the way. And the legal manifestation of such a prerogative consists of the right of withdrawal, the possibility the Commission has to withdraw uh, that proposal. As you know, this is not an absolute right. It is subject to certain conditions which have been scrutinized over time and often questioned. But the overall idea is that the Commission remains the custodian of the general interest of the EU. And therefore, its presence is justified on, on this basis. Yeah, an additional point to that. Um, we've been talking about the fact whether trilogues are actually an organized process or if there is some variability in, in how they are done. We've had experience from the outside, again, of course, um, of the Commission actually holding the pen drafting the fourth column document or the minutes uh, of trial of meetings. And I think, for one, that that is a step too far. Let alone, okay, commission is present, as you said, Alberto, as custodian of, of the general EU interest, but then taking it to the level of drafting that fourth column or the minutes of trial or tripartite meetings, I think that's a step too far. Okay. If I may, the reason why I think this is occurring, if I, may, if I may just comment upon Vicky's point, is the fact that this technical superiority of the Commission along the process is obvious. It's a technocratic institution that has spent, in average, two years doing an impact assessment of a dead proposal. It knows the actors. It knows exactly the dynamics. And unfortunately, as you might know, and we can say this, I can, at least I'm an independent academic, not all MEPs are like Michael Arbor. Not the MEPs have the time, the capability of engaging with the dossier and therefore being able to possibly put together enough evidence, enough understanding in order to create the conditions for a dialogue which is evidence-based. In those circumstances where the MEP's representation is weaker, is weaker on technical grounds, well, it's inevitable that the Commission feel compelled to somehow take the lead and somehow hold the pen. 
Yeah. No, and, and that is the, indeed how the Commission sees its, its role, but then you could say, okay, but Parliament uh, has, if it, the Parliament wants to bring up the technical expertise, then you give publicity to the issue, then you bring in people from outside the Brussels bubble, and then issues such as car emissions, which at one point may have sounded very technical to many people, and they thought, oh, we let that be dealt with in some, you know, trilogue behind closed doors uh, um, process, would now be something where, you know, many experts would like to get involved and many people would like to be heard because they've seen that, you know, the system that we've trusted actually cannot be trusted and it's time for us to get involved. So I think this, again, is, is really about... Uh, the perspective that we want to, or that you know, the institutions want to have first reading agreements, indeed, as you say, Alberto, gives the Commission a very, very strong hand. Uh, Parliament is in a weaker position because they always have, they do not have the detailed information about the position of the member states. If you want to balance that out, you have to bring in publicity, which means you have to go for a process that opens up. The publicity aspect is an interesting one. I mean, this is a question for you, Malcolm. I mean, have you ever spoken to one of your constituents? in the UK about trilogues? Uh, well, no, because, I mean, essentially it's the outcome, it's the outcome that interests people. Um, so, therefore, the policies that we are advocating as part of our negotiation, this is part of our legislative process. You know, I don't suppose members of Parliament in my constituency um, talk very much to their constituents uh, about the, the scrutiny committee on the floor of the House of Commons in detail about a piece of legislation. You know, this is part of the mechanics. This is, this is the mechanism of politics. Uh, and what we're talking about is producing a good, a, a good quality outcome uh, that where people feel that their, their interests have been taken into account in a balanced way. Now, I just come back to the point about the Commission. I have to say that, that in my experience in, 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 in participating in trialogues, not just chairing of trialogues, you know, the Commission, as far as I know, has never... Um, em, em, ever minuted or produced uh, results from any trial that I've ever been involved in. Um, but the Commission are valuable participants because they have enabled us to meet, uh, to, to, to produce and draft sensible proposals. Um, and uh, Antonia's point is, is, is an important one. Uh, Alberto's point is an important one because the Commission is also very conscious of the fact that legislation is ineffective unless it's properly implemented and can be properly scrutinized, and member states have the facilities to be able to test um, and sign off technical proposals. Car emissions is a good example. Uh, so, you know, the Commission brings that practical element to it. Uh, but, but there may be cases, and there have been cases I've been involved in, where Council and Parliament disagree quite fundamentally with what the Commission has proposed. And essentially, we've then drafted our own legislation. Um, the best example of that that I was involved in was in telecommunications, and I know that the Ombudsman has just done a report on the follow-on from that. Uh, but the, the, the Commission proposed a centralised regulator for electronic communications. Parliament and Council disagreed with it. Uh, Parliament and Council drafted a different piece of legislation to set up the Bureau of Electronic Regulations of Electronic Communications. And I also remind you of a power that's in the treaties, which hasn't been used very much, but the commission, the commission goes to council meetings also, and if the commission fundamentally disagrees with the position that the council has taken, they can force the council to adopt it by unanimity. Essentially, it's a blocking power. And now, that isn't used very often, and I think the occasions on which it's used are not often publicised, but I'm, I know uh, that, this was, uh, the, the, that Mrs. Redding, as the commissioner, was not keen on the council's proposal and forced them to adopt it by unanimity. I think that the, uh, it'd probably be useful for us just to take a look at what papers from the trilogue, uh, trilogue meetings uh, are accessible uh, by the public. And then we'll turn to what we'd like to be able to see uh, from trilogues. And then, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be looking to you for your questions, please. So, uh, up, straight away. I'll be with you very shortly, sir. So... What papers can we get, get a hold of from a trilogue meeting now, Alberto? Well, as I said earlier, is, formally speaking, something that doesn't really take place. So there are instances in which NGOs like Transparency International, Accessing for Europe, and others have been asking 
for documents uh, like minutes or list of participants uh, that were part of these meetings that in principle should have taken place, we know, here in the Parliament. And the answer uh, have been different, uh, but overall it has been difficult to get hold of the documents that for, sometimes for the reason that there has been a tendency of the Council, for instance, to say, or the Parliament to say, well, it's the Presidency who is holding these documents. Uh, we don't really know exactly what is occurring. We are talking about informal gatherings, so we don't have the possibility uh, to leverage on Regulation 149 as we would like to, and therefore there are, there are weaknesses. The overall situation is a sort of switching off, turning off of the legit democratic cr credentials or qualities of the legislative process. During that space, it's very difficult for all of us to grab the realities of, of what is going on. And could you just, I'm sorry, could you just uh, clarify, Regulation 149 is? Is the regulation granting all of us uh, the right to ask for documents to the European institutions? Okay. Yogo, I'm quite keen to come to you on this issue as well. I mean, what information would you like from these meetings? It seems to me, first of all, that at the moment there is no information publicly available. One has to say that very clearly. Uh, they don't even make the calendar publicly available when they have the trilogue meeting, let alone the text that they're discussing, let alone what the individual parties have been saying on it let, or, or the conclusions of it. So it's, it's really not, um, unless you have connections to the people inside, which of course good lobbyists do, uh, you don't know, which again comes to my point that the trilogue is, uh, presents some risks because uh, as any secretive process, there is a fundamental tension with, with democratic decision-making. So what I'd like to see, from the perspective of an organization that works very much through public debate and that tries to bring in the public interest into European decision-making by stimulating public debate, um, we would certainly like, first of all, Again, the fundamental point, we don't, wouldn't like to see trilogues early on in the process. They have a justification, you know, once the institutions have gone through and the parliament has gone through two readings and you come to formal conciliation or possibly before then, there's a justification that maybe you want to start bringing the three institutions together. But if you do it too early, you, you preclude uh, the, the possibility to, to get really the public informed and involved. Um, at the late stage, what we'd like to see as a minimum is the calendar of the meetings. We'd like to have, I think it should be publicly known, what are they discussing? And then there can be some, I think it's justified that there is some, uh, what's the word? Um, disc, uh, God, this morning my English is a bit rusty. Um, Minutes? Some, some freedom to, mm -hmm. to, to the extent that if they want to discuss certain options, that not every word that every person has said needs to necessarily be immediately made public. Okay. But certainly, if, if, if the public doesn't know what they're discussing and when they're discussing it, then the chance to, uh, to get involved is limited to the lobbyists in Brussels. If they weren't here, the issue would be different. You know, maybe then you wouldn't have to make that publicly known either, but since there are a lot of very well-resourced lobbyists in Brussels who anyway have that information, even if it's not publicly available, you need to make really some documents publicly available so that you slightly balance that inequality of lobbying power. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so it's actually, we'll go to Vicky first, because I'm interested as well to see if there are any advantages to keeping some secrecy. Well, again, if, if you talk about a formal informal process, if you'd compare it to national level, I think it, it is in a way an illusion to think that whichever goes on in terms of discussions internally in trilogues, you'd have a full-fledged report on it uh, after every trilogue meeting. Uh, between that and what we have today, I think there's large room for improvement. It's been said, and I couldn't agree on it, more timetables, but also, and then coming to what Mr. Harbour said, also the more technical meetings taking place, not, as I sometimes call them, the trilogues you see sometimes announced in press, well, trilogues have started on and they will take place in the coming months, but also more on the technical meetings. Because I'm, I'm, I'm always very cautious about this cascading effect. Used to have a full-fledged ordinary legislative procedure, 
moved into trilogues, and now in an area where you have tripartite meetings taking place very early on. Um, I don't know if there's a possibility if there's no fourth column document that's being published, and I think it's difficult given the frequency at which some trilogues meetings are held. If we could not at least have some kind of minutes of meetings, again, not disclosing the full-fledged uh, negotiating positions of every party and agreement reached, but at least some kind of indication on which points progress has been made and on which point work still needs to be done in a bit more in detail than what we have in press Sorry, now. Ricky, but if you, could, if you could quickly also explain what a fourth column document is. I think that's, that's, uh, that'll be worthwhile. <laughs> well, very, very quickly, but I, given the raise of hand earlier on about trilogues, I presume for me, most of you it's also pretty clear on what a four-column document is. But it is basically the document upon which the negotiations in trilogues take place. And you have first column a commission a proposal, second column parliament's position, third column council position, and the fourth column is the compromise, where if all goes well at the end of trilogues, you'd have the final legislative text written down. Okay, we'll go to Malcolm extremely quickly, okay. please, Malcolm, because I'm very keen to come to this gentleman. And then after this gentleman's question, we'll come back to you, Alberto. Okay, yes, well, very quickly, because I'm keen to hear as well, but just from a practical point of view. First of all, I mean, the four-column documents are extremely indigestible. Uh, I mean, the four-column documents for the public procurement uh, directive were about, ran to about 400 pages, each one, and they had to be reissued each time. Uh, the trialogues aren't minuted, essentially, because the outcome of the trialogue is a further progress on filling in that, that fourth column. Uh, and I agree it would be a good idea to have more progress reports on that in a more formal way. Um, I, I would have no problem at all in publishing the calendar of meetings. I can't understand why those aren't published, because, as I said earlier, they're set well in advance. Um, and normally we will decide a week before what's going to be discussed. Um, and also... Um, again, we don't have minutes of meetings, and I think that's important because, again, I don't think that that is, is necessarily going to be particularly revealing anyway because there will be a lot of to and froing in the meetings. The outcomes are important. The final thing is, that, and something that uh, we were asked to do and which I used to do in my committee, is that every time the committee met uh, during a trialogue process, when we had a trialogue in process, um, I always ask the rapporteur or, or his or her representative to come and report to the committee in public about progress in the trialogue and how, what, we were, what we were doing and what the critical issues were. And that was always the first item on the meeting. The problem was it was never really widely reported. Um, and we, ha we used to put, as far as I know, the, the written reports were on the committee minutes, but nobody took much interest in them. Can I, can I just make yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I think one, one of the things that I, I would certainly like clarity on, and perhaps uh, people in, in the uh, audience as well, uh, there was a comment that was made, um, n not every MEP is like uh, um, Malcolm Harbour, uh, and I'm not sure the degree to which every, every trilogue that, uh, that Malcolm chaired is typical of, of all trilogues. Um, he, he, sketch, he sketched out a, um, a, very, a very elaborate and clearly very well organised um, uh, a description of, I think it was the, the procurement uh, uh, piece that, 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 that was done, which um, went across, I think, five years and two and a half years in preparation, and you could, you could hardly fault it. So I think if every trilogue and process was like that, then we might as well all go and have coffee and go home. Um, I, I suspect that that is not the case, but, but I don't know the extent to which it is not the case. So perhaps somebody could uh, elaborate on that. Right. I think... Give Right, this, this, all, all what has been asked around this table, uh, the minutes, the list of participants, the calendar, are issues that are generally covered by the principle according to which the European institution should work as openly as possible, which is the very beginning of our treaty. And in particular, they fit very well by Article 15, Paragraph 3 of the treaty that says that the legislative process should be published, should be uh, basically made public to all of us. So we are not basically asking for the moon. We are really asking for aligning an informal procedure to the standards, principles governing the legislative process. That's what we are asking for. But on top of that, you might also argue that today the principle of openness, institutional openness and access to document is not only about a sort of passive duty of the institution to wait for your request and then possibly deciding whether to grant you access. Today, the principle of institutional openness and access documents is about a proactive duty that all institutions are subject to to decide ex ante, upstream, what they're going to grant access to the public. So that's basically where we are 
when we look at the formal procedures and the state of transparency, and that's where we are when talking about the informal procedures. Basically, is really the, the old days, and, and we, there's a clear gap, even a temporal lap, uh, gap between the formal and the informal procedures. Now, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, sir, but uh, now that we've, we've discussed the access to documents, Yogo, you, you make a lot of uh, applications for European Commission documents, don't you? Well, I don't know how it compares, but we certainly do... Uh, ask for access to documents in order to better understand how the Commission comes to certain decisions. And uh, the Ombudsman earlier on uh, was, you know, making reference to the May communication from the Commission where it made the business case for transparency and how, how better regulation and better lawmaking uh, requ um, requires also more transparency. And it just makes me smile because that's the public case that they make but since then we've received documents like this you know where <laughs> where we've asked the, com the commission has made a proposal um, following up on, on President Juncker's uh, promise to make the decision making process on GMOs more democratic and they say they've analyzed three options and they've proposed one option to parliament and council and both houses I think are about to reject it because it does not meet the promise so we were keen to see what the other two options were to be able to follow whether the option the Commission chose really was the best of the three options. And then they say, yes, we have the policy options here. They, they shifted from blacking out to graying out. <laughs> it, it saves a bit of toner, but otherwise it's uh, as useless. So again, I mean, that's uh, the discrepancy between talking and, and walking the talk. Okay. Finally, sir, you've been extremely patient. Can you introduce yourself and uh, your organization and ask your question, please? Okay, thanks. Uh, Emilio De Capitani, I'm the executive director of the Fundamental Rights European Experts Group, but moreover, I am a former European Parliament official and the secretary of the committee who started in 2001 with the first reading agreements. At the time, the idea was a dialogue, and even a trialogue, but dialogue, not confusing the will of the two institutions. Because the problem that we have here is that uh, behind uh, the trialogues, uh, there is real negotiation. So uh, you don't know what is asking Germany. You don't know what the socialists are asking. So the citizens ignore when the formal first reading of the parliament arrive, if what has been voted has been voted according to a position of the members who have been elected, or under the pressure of some member states. The only thing that you know is something that appears some, somewhere at some time, but uh, it can take one year, two years of first uh, nego uh, reading negotiation without no knowing nothing. Uh, in the last legislature, 1,517 trilogues took place, and of these, nothing has been published. Uh, I don't agree with uh, uh, Honorable Harbour on the fact that multi-column documents are not interesting. They are extremely interesting because finally I know what the members of the Parliament want and what the Council want. Again, you are right when you say the presidency and you don't know if Germany is behind or not. But you can know with some good lobbyists. The point of multi-column documents is that give you every time every change. But these documents are not accessible. And this is the reason why I have challenged the Parliament who refused to give me some multi columns documents. Because I think that the old logic of the treaty is a sort of a successive frame. First the Commission, then the Parliament, then the Council, then the Parliament, then the Conciliation Committee. If you mix everything, you don't understand who is deciding what. And again, I'm not uh, agree on the fact that when you are arrive on a first reading agreement, you don't rubber stamp something. You are rubber stamp, uh, stamping a compromise who has already in the pocket the agreement of the co-repair. 
So you can maybe refuse it, but it's a very exception. Okay, so thank you very much. So no, I have finished with a question. You can end everything with, with only one decision. Tomorrow, the European Parliament Bureau can decide that all the trilogues related documents should be public. They didn't. Okay. Um, I think we'll just take a couple more questions. Uh, yes, you, sir, and then uh, you as well. So please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. My name is uh, Carl Dolan. I'm the uh, director of the uh, Transparency International Office here in Brussels. And uh, I just want to go back to something in the uh, Ombudsman's opening remarks, in fact, uh, where she posed a series of questions at the end, and one of the questions was, uh, would greater transparency around the trilogue process provide even more opportunities for lobbying uh, for better resourced organizations? And I assume the, the Ombudsman is, was being deliberately provocative here in asking that question, in which case... It worked because I think it's an open secret in, in Brussels, and Jorg already adverted to this, that uh, the trilogue process is only secretive and opaque if you are not a very well-resourced uh, lobbying organization here in Brussels. If you are prepared to put in the legwork and talk to you know, kindly permanent representations or kindly assistance, you can get the much prize for a column document. You know exactly what is going on in the trilogue meetings. It's only those, citi those citizens, not only citizens, maybe those... Uh, uh, MPs and national parliaments, as Marbury was, uh, Mark Malcolm was saying, that don't know what's going on in the process in real time. Now, what we're seeing uh, in the Commission, for example, is baby steps towards something called a legislative footprint, where uh, the Commission is actually documenting in real time its contact with lobbyists. Now, I think given the, that the shadow rapporteurs, the rapporteurs are, are key in all this process, I think it would be no point in producing any documentation associated with the trilogues unless you also, they also document their meetings with lobbyists in real time around the trilogue process. So at the moment, the process is actually advantages lobbyists. Um, and it also, I think, advantages spin because one other uh, feature about the current trilogue setup is that when political agreements are, are reached, you get a flurry of tweets and press releases and communications from the political actors involved, and the media reports these press releases and tweets, etc. What they don't report is the text that's produced four weeks later, which is often very at odds with what, what the uh, press release has stated. So this is not uh, uh, something. This also advantages spin and lobbying. I mean, I, just just to add to that, I've actually uh, covered trilogue meetings, and you know, you turn up at the room. The council leaves, the commission leaves, and you're left with a rapporteur. And uh, they will talk to you usually. Uh, but, of course, then you're only getting one side of the story. And it's the story that they want to give you. Um, you've been very patient. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is actually more of a, a comment than a question. But um, my name is Anna Buchta, and I represent the European Data Protection Supervisor. So uh, our work uh, recently has been mentioned uh, a few times already today, and I just would like to uh, maybe explain a little bit uh, or set the re record straight. So um, we take particularly keen interest on one, uh, in one of the uh, trilogue negotiations that are, that are going on right now concerning the general data protection regulation. Uh, from the very beginning, and this neg these negotiations have been uh, not the trilogue, but the proposal has been published in January 2012. And from the beginning, it has been quite a peculiar process with controlled leaks of preliminary proposals, disappearing articles. Um, my institution and our advisory role have even taken the unprecedented step at the time to comment in an official document on a you know, disappeared article from an unofficial version because we thought that was such a striking uh, change. Um, anyway, more recently we have also seen that some of the very secret trilogue related documents uh, are actually become available on the internet, uh, including preparatory four column tables, uh, presidency debriefings from trilogues, including tables. Um, and uh, allegedly that happens even before these documents are being circulated via the, the official channels. But that's a comment. Um, since, in the context of the, the GDPR, uh, the main cornerstones of the future um, regime for data protection are supposed to be accountability and transparency. 
the EDPS also uh, called on the co-legislators to implement those principles in practice and also to be more transparent throughout the entire process. Um, and as part of our latest contribution, uh, we have released indeed a four-column table which lists all the, the three texts, so as explained, the Commission, the Parliament, the Council, and we provide our own recommendations for drafting. But, but what for us is even more um, important, we produced a mobile app which is currently available for two platforms, iOS and, um, and Android, and which allows any four-column document to be easily accessible on any mobile device. You can compare up to four texts on, an, uh, on a tablet. You can have two texts on a mobile phone. And we are already uh, receiving very positive uh, feedback, especially from outside Brussels, since it's been explained. For people in the bubble, it's not so difficult to get hold of any four-column table and to process them. But for those who are more you know, removed from, from the, the inside circle, this is a real eye-opener. So, just to clarify, we do not disclose any Trilog-related material. Our app just has the, the, the proposal plus the first reading positions. And, of the two and in terms of the public's reaction to, to that, I mean, what sort of pickup has there been? Well, certainly the comments that we, we have heard was that finally it becomes, you know, the idea, the mythical four-column table uh, have become very accessible uh, to people. And it's, it's sometimes really a, an eye-opener and allows them to understand better what the trilogue is and how it works. Um, and obviously, uh, well, obviously, we have, we have even been contact contacted by some services of the Commission and by, by other stakeholders who would be interested in using this platform, this app, for other uh, files and, and uh, to, disclose, to disclose documents. And, of course, we are very happy to, Thank to you. do that. Um, Thank you. I think mean, you, so, and then I'll come to you, and then... All right. Well, this is good. So I'll, I'll come back to you shortly, but I'll take two questions at a time. So please go ahead. Um, good, good morning. Uh, Brian Hayes, MEP. I'm an Irish Member of Parliament and a member of Econ Committee. And um, before that, I, I was uh, an Irish Government Minister, so I attended uh, quite a number of uh, trilogue meetings during the course of the uh, Irish Presidency. So I'm, I'm now kind of poacher term gamekeeper, you could say, in terms of uh, what I've seen on both sides. Firstly, can I agree with Malcolm Harbour, his remark about national parliaments, this presumption, uh, rather naive presumption, uh, that every um, member of parliament in the 28 member states of the European Union is absolutely connected with every legislation that is proposed is utterly naive. Uh, the same problems that exist in this parliament exist in, in uh, our member state parliaments, and we, what we've got to do is to bridge that difference. And I think one of the ways we can do that is through the green paper approach. Um, it seems to me there will be obviously less legislation in this commission. It's a clear objective of the, of the new commission in terms of uh, better regulation, less legislation. There seems to be an opportunity now to do things differently over the next four years or so because we will have less legislation. And it seems to me that the green paper approach is the logical way to involve member state parliaments, interested people, consultations, take capital markets union, which I understand will be proposed on Wednesday of this week, um, there has been a green paper there. There have been very significant consultations. Over 700 people sent submissions in. That is the way to approach all aspects of legislation. Uh, my second remark, and it's really a question, um, trilogues very much depend on the presidency. Not all presidencies are, are big countries with large clout. Uh, if, if you're a small country and you hold the ship of state, of Europe for a six-month period. Your objective is to get as many files as you can through, through the uh, six-month period because the more files you have, the more you're seen to have done a good job. That does not necessarily mean that the, the work over that six months is actually the key work that needs to be advanced by the European Union. I'd be interested for your comments on that because uh, the presidency has never really published its priorities, its realistic priorities, for the legislative period uh, during the trilogue period. And I think that is something uh, that, that is um, important because without that, you are not going to get the public engagement 
in those net issues which are going to be advanced over the six months of, uh, of the presidency. My final remark is we have to be realistic about documentation. Um, we've got to make sure that the net issues that are involved between the co-legislators, in this case Parliament and, and Council, would be set out there that people can understand in a readable form. And too often the language, the jargon, immediately puts people in member states off because they just don't follow the jargon that we constantly use. Thank you. And yes, we'll just take a, a question from uh, you. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Catherine Fior. Uh, I'm, I work with EU Reporter. Uh, I just have a, a, a question. You've uh, held up uh, Malcolm Harbour as a particularly fastidious and exemplary MEP when it comes to holding trilogues. Uh, I was wondering if the Ombudsman could say perhaps why um, she has chosen the areas of clinical trials regulation and mortgage credit and the mortgage credit directive uh, for study. Were these area were these um, areas where you had questions or you received questions from the public, um, or they were held to be particularly lacking in transparency? Thank you. No, absolutely not. Uh, we, um, we wanted to look at uh, trilogues and legislative proposals that had been, had been completed. So we just chose those simply because we thought they might have a resonance with, with the public. Obviously, clinical trials is a huge issue. Equally, mortgage credit, there, there was nothing particular about them other than that, other than we felt that they, they just had a, a public interest beyond the more, more technical uh, pieces that... Um, uh, that, that go through. That's all. I think I explained that in, in the letter to the, uh, the Council, the Commission, the Parliament. Thank you. Just before we go to uh, another question, I'd like to give the panel a chance to uh, respond to Mr. Hayes' comments about the Green Paper and the strength or weakness of different presidencies. And we'll start with Malcolm. Yeah. Um, I was very interested to hear from uh, Mr. Capitani, who I've obviously known for a long time. Um, just to make it clear, when I was talking about the value of multi-column documents and a way it relates to, to the comment, I think it was Mr. Donor from Transparency International, I mean, they are, as they are at the moment, the paper copies, or even in word processing form, are extremely dense. And, I mean, you need to spend a lot of time even if you get the documents, so they're very resource intensive. Um, I, I mean, I think they're very valuable if, if we can have the sort of technology that the GDPS is pioneering. Uh, and then I would like to see those. That could, could, in my view, it should be progressively updated as items are provisionally agreed. I see no problem with that whatsoever. And for long and complex texts, it means that people would have the opportunity to see how the agreement is, is evolving. Um, you may go back to some of that. That's fine as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and also I would clearly identify um, areas which have been subject to study because what we haven't talked about is something that, uh, again, we, we, we followed... Um, our requirements, because uh, you know, under the rules of procedure, committees, if they introduce um, amendments that are significantly altering the balance of the text or introducing maybe new complexities or costs, to subject it to an impact assessment. Uh, and similarly, when we were in negotiations with council, for example, on the public procurement directive, when council wanted to introduce something that we thought would be detrimental to small business, we went and uh, costed that and presented the results to them in order to justify our position. Uh, and all of those things um, are not comprehensively documented, but in my view, should be. Um, the second point I want to make, because I'm delighted that Brian Hayes is here, because you probably hadn't noticed, but I'm wearing the Irish presidency tie. Um, and that's not just in honor of the, of the Ombudsman, but because um, I, you've given me the opportunity to make the point that the Irish presidency was one of the best that I worked with, and not just because we settled a number of dossiers, but because of direct engagement with ministers. And Brian Hayes at that time was a minister, so he's here. And I can say that I had more direct engagement with ministers in the, in the Irish government during their presidency um, who were following the progress of, the, of our proposals closely and directly engaged with that work than I did in any other presidency that I worked with. Um, and, you know, and I think that just shows that Member states at a political level are, of course, directly involved in this process. Uh, and what we haven't talked about, of course, is the lack of transparency about all the working group discussions um, and how those ought to be opened up much earlier because it would save us a lot of time in sorting out some of the technical problems with the legislation instead of waiting until they adopt a huge text and then have to spend time re-engineering it 
um, in things like delegated implementing acts, other technical details, which we could have done um, six months earlier. Uh, and, you know, this is part of actually making the, the legislative process more effective, more open, and producing better quality outcomes. Thank you. Uh, yes, we'll take a question. Yeah, my name is Tony Bunyan from State Watch. Uh, as you may know, I've been working on this area for a long time. Just two or three comments. One, how did travellers come about? It is very simple what travellers come about. They came about as soon as the Parliament got the power of co-decision. It is as clear as that. It was a cynical move by the Council, which over the years the Parliament has colluded in, quite frankly. That's why it occurred. You look at every stage when it, it was due to co-decision. I'm not quite sure what, quite what world I'm in. 15.3 of, of the Lisbon Treaty talks about all documents related to legislative project being public. It's six years on. It's not a debate about the, the legislature, which ones to make public or which not. It's the whole lot, or else you may well rip up the treaty. So as far as I'm concerned, what you've got at the moment is, as a few, and I'm not in the Brussels bubble, I do come here, when the Council as a legislator and the Parliament as legislature meet, they are the European legislature in effect. And they're meeting in secret, in other words, it's not open, and it's, not, it's, not, it's also not transparent because people can't get the documents. I just don't know what sort of world we're talking about, we're fiddling here and fiddling there. I mean, it is a fact that 84% of the Libe meeting things are going through on, on, on the first reading. It is true they're not adopted in the trialogue, but how often, when they are adopted in the committee and the parliament, are they ever changed or rejected? How many hands do you need to count? Thank you. Thank you. Alberto, yes. you know a lot about EU law. Is uh, this lack of transparency, is it actually illegal, according to the treaty? Well, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, most of the requests that are coming from the table here, they seem to be somehow covered by, by, by the treaty itself. As I mentioned, there is this principle of institutional openness. There is Article 15.3 that remain largely dead letter when we apply this provision to the informal gatherings. And as I said, this raises a concern because there's a clear gap between the formal procedures and the principles governing those procedures and the informality which remains there despite the institutionalization that we are all witnessing. So how can we fill this gap? As I mentioned, there are several, there are several NGOs. I mentioned Transparency International. I could mention State Watch and many other, Greenpeace and other NGOs, who try to get access to those documents. And in the absence of the availability of this information, they rely on access to information, the regulation I mentioned earlier. And until now, they didn't have much of success. But there are further movement. There are further processes. Think about the Better Regulation Watchdog, a new organization which is an alliance of NGOs who tries exactly to possibly put pressure on the MEPs, on all the European institutions when it comes to the evidence which is gathered during the conversation, both in the trilogues and in the legislative process. This is where I expect something to happen in the future. More requests for access to documents, possibly more complaints, and even cases in front of the Court of Justice. Um, as I mentioned, the trialogues are also becoming quadrilogues. There are more and more situations in which these informal gatherings are raising doubts, and possibly that's where, where we should focus on uh, in, in the future, and all actors in the ecosystem have a role to play. Now, there are a couple of other questions. Uh, yes, the gentleman there, and then we'll go to the gentleman here. Yes, hello. My, my name is Daniel Freund. Uh, I was an assistant here in the Parliament during the last term and uh, wanted to provide some feedback on one of the trilogues that I sat in on that were not as the ones that, that Mr. Harbour described, where even, well, for, for the MEPs or us as assistants in, in the House here, uh, we were usually informed about a week in advance when, when a pri trilogue would take place. Um, when it, this, this one in particular was on the statute of European political parties, which was a dossier that was sort of rushed through to finalize it before the European elections. We got the final text that, that was to be decided on a Tuesday, on a Friday night, a 200-page document that then had to be worked through. Until then, we had only worked with non-papers or, or other kind of informal documents uh, that, uh, that had been used. 
But I, I think in, in terms of transparency, when we mention the four-column documents, what's, what, what we really talk about is the third column, because the, the parliament position ultimately is, is very well known, and the committee meetings are web-streamed, and we can access all those documents. The commission proposal as well is available online, so the first two columns everyone can patch together. What's lacking is the third column and the, the intransparency in the council, and where even for us as insiders, as assistants in the European Parliament, it was impossible to know where member states' positions are. We heard from the, from the presidency during, during the trilogue, and we know what their position are, but we have no idea where exactly the majority lies, uh, which countries can be, can be won over to, to one side or the other of an argument, and whether, in, in some cases, even the presidency is just exploiting its role as the presidency because they, they have the advantage of being in the negotiations. They can put their own point of view forward, and there's almost no way to, to check up if that is the, the majority position in the council or not, unless you spend all your day on the phone calling through uh, the, the perm reps and, and getting that information. So basically what, what we need for that accountability uh, in, in trilogues and, and indeed for the whole legislative pro process is to be able to see where do these positions come from? What, where, how do member states in the council come, come up with, with their positions? And, and ultimately, state by state, I don't only want to see the third column, this is the, the majority position in the council, but I need to see, well, basically what they do in the working group, it, each country, where, where do they stand on, on each one of these points? Thank you very much. That's an excellent contribution. And yes, sir, just over to you. We'll take uh, your question and then we'll have some reaction to, uh, to it. Let me start by thanking the European Ombudsman for organizing this event. I'm Giacomo Ruggia, and I'm a research fellow at Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. <clears throat> I, my feeling is that trialogues are inherent in the EULA making process. First example can be traced back to 1975 with the conciliation procedure and also forms of dialogue between legislative institutions are a common feature of many uh, constitutional legal order. Um, one can think, for example, of the Informe de la Ponencia in Spain or similar, similar examples in the US or in Italy. So uh, my intuition is that uh, lawmaking processes cannot do without some degree of informality. The possibility of formalizing trialogues in the treaties was extensively discussed during the European Convention, and at the end of it, Group 9 on Simplification decided that um, formalizing trialogue was not a good idea because their rationale and their usefulness laid precisely in their informality and flexibility. In light of this, what I fear is that Formalizing trialogues might lead the EU political institutions to look for different fora where to negotiate informally. As it was mentioned before, I think that legislative, the legislative process has two souls, one formal and one informal. And about the problem between transparency and effectiveness, efficiency of the EU legislative process, there are many legal bases on the, in the treaties providing for transparency, but there are at least two, one legal basis, Article 13, which provides for the effectiveness of the EU institutions, and also in the preamble of the treaties, there is reference to the need for a unitary institutional setting, effective and efficient. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd just like to uh, turn to the panel now. Accountability, member states' positions. Can we do without informality? I'll start with you, Yoga. Yeah, member states, uh, I, I think the comment that was made from, from the gentleman who worked uh, as a parliamentary assistant is absolutely uh, important because I've said earlier the Commission is everywhere in the whole trilogue system in the sense that they know what's being discussed in Parliament and in Council and they play that to their advantage. And the Council, one could add, is playing the fact that it is the least transparent of the three institutions to its advantage. And that is really a, a bit of a perversion of the whole thing. So in order for the, for the trilogues to work better, one would need also to force more transparency onto the Council, or the Council should finally also uh, agree to make 
uh, maybe to allow the Parliament to its working group sessions, first of all, to give balance to the Commission, but, but more clearly in terms of public interest, to make country positions publicly known and to have a record of Council working group uh, meetings. Um, I think we have to be careful to talk along that there is a tension between transparency and efficiency. Malcolm Harbour said earlier on that, that he's not aware of any study that shows, in fact, that less transparency gives you more efficient legislation, even faster legislation. And certainly if we think of European legislation not ending in Brussels, but in actually being accepted and implemented by the member states and the public and the citizens in the member states, then certainly transparency helps for efficient legislation because you get much better public acceptance when the thing has been properly debated rather than when it was agreed quickly by a group of people that nobody knows who they were when they met and what they actually talked about. Okay, Vicky? Yes, there's been a lot of talk about transparency, efficiency of, of decision making. I'd like to perhaps bring in another point there, and that's the quality of legislation. I think that if, if one resorts to trilogues, I think the objective is to be efficient in developing legislation. But I would also think that uh, the reason behind it is also to develop good quality legislation. And I'm not speaking about how well something is written, because we all know, I think, the struggles EU jargon uh, can bring to us. The fact that we have a different legal system doesn't facilitate uh, that altogether. But it's the precision of legislation. You would expect that, again, if you put trilogues in place and you have the right people around the table, you come to relatively detailed and well thought through uh, pieces of legislation. And unfortunately, again, from the outside, that's not the perspective we have. I think often we see that a number of important matters, which actually should have been legislated on, are not legislated on two, two trilogues, but are actually reverted to something that then becomes a delegated or an implementing act, like Mr. Harbour mentioned, or even if you take it a step further down, which is something that becomes guidelines and that becomes soft law. So I think that is that issue as well to take into account, that I'm not at all convinced that the uh, systematic use of trilogues has actually improved the quality of legislation, but quite the contrary. Okay, do we have any, uh, would you like to make a well, very comment, quickly, Alberto? Very, very quickly, if I can uh, build upon some of the comments that have been made, I think it's important to look at the informal procedures existing at the national level. Uh, it is absolutely true that it is somehow inherent to any constitutional system to uh, somehow accommodate both informal and formal procedures, but at the same time, we need to realize once more the specificity of the European legislative uh, system in which we have the European Commission, which holds the monopoly for the initiative of, of legislation, in which renders the probability of the adoption of such a proposal extremely high. As you might know, we are here about between 95% of European yeah. legislative proposals are adopted. If you compare this with national experiences, you know, only 5% of bills which are tabled to the U.S. Congress are adopted. So we are really thinking about a completely different dimension that renders also the debate about effectiveness versus transparency a bit more special. And therefore, we possibly, we need to take this into account when thinking about how we're going to strike the balance between, between these two. Uh, I just uh, want to, to pick up a few of the points, but just uh, I was very interested in what a colleague from State Watch had to say, so I can remember your name. But um, just to draw your attention to what I think, again, has been a long overdue element of transparency within this House, the Parliament, um, is that just towards the end of, and the very end of my time as Chairman, so this, uh, this was 2014, uh, we've now finally had um, a, a compulsory roll call vote. Uh, at the end of any adoption of any report in the Parliament. Uh, I mean, it's astonishing we haven't had that before, but that means that, uh, that, that you can see uh, which representatives voted in committee uh, for the adoption of legislation. We haven't had it on individual amendments. Um, and, of course, part of the, uh, the process of a committee going through a piece of legislation uh, is that uh, a lot of it is technical detail where there's a wide consensus uh, but there are always a number of crucial clauses where political groups are opposed and majorities win. And, I mean, you can actually see those if you, if you see, after all, in the transparency of the process, every committee meeting and every vote of this parliament is on the Internet, and, uh, and there's a historical archive of that. So you can always see 
the areas where, where there's been where political representatives uh, have disagreed. But in the end, we have a Parliament's position in committee, uh, and then the decision in terms of negotiation, if it's first reading, is that uh, you go into the, as the committee to defend Parliament's position. Now, I mean, part of transparency, my perspective, was always to have the shadow rapporteurs from all the other political groups there, so that they were able to see and understand the discussion and contribute to it if they felt that, we, that the committee was making too many concessions. Um, I mean, that's part of the discussion. I don't think that that would be recorded in mini minutes, but the, it's the outcome that will be important. Um, on the question of quality, I just want to come back to what I said earlier about preparatory work. I, I, in my experience, part of the, the, the key issue that comes out of trialogues in many cases is member states um, who agree uh, with the proposal from the Commission in principle but say that in this formulation it's impossible for us to implement or it's very difficult for us to implement or we don't think it's, it's, it's very clear. So in other words, I would say to Vicky, you know, quite a lot of our time was debating what the council proposed as, as improvements and to see whether they really were improvements in quality of the proposal. Then in, some, in more extreme cases, if necessary, a good committee should also then commission its own research to see whether it felt the council was right to do that. And that's part of the overall process. But I think coming back to the, the broader issues about the Brown Hayes made, the real difficulty is finding ways of getting national parliamentarians uh, engaged with that, which is why I attach a great deal of importance uh, for, for ministers in, in the competitive councils or other councils, environment council, to be spending far more time talking about forthcoming legislative proposals um, and preparing for those and making public speeches about it because I have to accept the fact that after many years, 15 years as a UK politician, almost nobody knew who I was. Uh, one of my colleagues once described me uh, to a conservative audience as uh, the most powerful conservative that you've never heard of. Um, you know, well, I had, I had a, obviously an important position in the parliament, um, and I don't think it was that powerful, by the way. But, um, but actually, national parliamentarians have much more traction, I'm sure Brown would agree with me, members of the European Parliament. And the more that we, we, we get ministers talking about the issues and the more that you engage um, interest groups in member states and parliamentarians, the, first of all, the better outcome we will be, but the more commitment there will be then to carrying out and making sure that legislation is effective. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm, uh, when, when you were in these trilogues, um, were you ever subject to any aggressive lobbying by special interest groups? large lobbying firms? No. That's interesting. Um, no, really. I mean, I, would say I mean, the trial law process is, is, the most, is the most, you know, that is the most concentrated process. Uh, I mean, obviously, by that time, we'd have been through a whole lot of detail about the proposal. Uh, but, I mean, I, I, I was the chairman of the committee, so it's important that I represented the committee's position, and I think people respected that. But do you think um, that the, sorry, but do you think that the trilogue system itself, that protected you from lobbying? <coughs> no, well, I mean, I don't think you need to be protected from lobbying. You need to be able to, uh, to handle it in a mature and responsible way. Okay. Because, after all, on these very complex issues, and you have to remember what the workload of parliamentarians is and what they're expected to know about in detail. You know, so one, I mean, when we had a whole series, I had a whole series of parallel trial logs running. I had radio equipment, I had a mutual recognition of professional qualifications, and I had public procurement all running together. Now, you know, that, 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 that variety of, of aspects that we're asking parliamentarians to deal with, they need some experts' reference points. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we need information from knowledgeable people who have different points of view. The question is how you use that and what judgments you make on it. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, please go ahead. Uh. Thank you. Uh, Anna Isbertier from Client Earth. Um, maybe I can give a bit of examples uh, about... I'm sorry, could you just repeat your name again? We couldn't Anaïs, hear it up here. Anna Isbertier from Client Earth. Thank you. 
Uh, and when we are one of the organizations that have made access to documents request actually to get access to the documents, to the minutes of the trialogue meetings. Uh, within three different legislative processes now, the, the, the adoption of the seventh environmental action program, the review of the environmental impact assessment directive, and today the adoption of the trade secret directive. Um, and I can say that actually, yes, very few uh, information is provided. Uh, the Parliament gives access to one page uh, summary of the issues that have been discussed, which is already something. At least we were able to, to know what points, what were the main points that were being discussed. But I thought that the reply from the Council and the Commission, but to, to end on the reply from the European Parliament, of course it was not enough, because to understand this minute, it meant that you already had to know everything that had been discussed before, that you had to know the numbers of the amendments by heart, because it was a list of the numbers of the amendments that had been discussed, like more than 200. So it was not readable and, of course, not understandable for the citizen and even not for lobbyists in Brussels. I mean, you had to have access to all the other documents, notably uh, the, the amendments that had been proposed by the different MEPs, and these are made publicly accessible generally on the website the day before uh, the, the, the vote is taking place generally in the committee, I mean, sometimes in the committee. Well, that was the case in, in one of our process. So no possibility for the public to, to provide input, to oppose, to support, to critique, anything. Uh, but the reply from the Commission and the Council, I think, are really edifying because the exceptions that they rely upon to uh, keep this information confidential is also Article 4.3 of Regulation 1049, the protection of the internal decision-making process. And the reason is that because the decision-making process is ongoing. So I think it's really interesting to understand because the position of the European Commission and the, and the Council is that, yes, you can have access to the information, but once the whole negotiation and discussion will be over, and once the text of uh, the, the legislative text will be adopted. So public debate is also qualified as undue pressure. It's only undue pressure for these institutions. Uh, and so I think there is really a, a need for a change in the mindset. Public debate, democratic debate, is not only undue pressure. Okay, thank you. And Yoga, I know you wanted to respond to that. I wanted to link that also to the response that Malcolm gave to your question on whether he was lobbied, uh, because I think Malcolm's perspective is um, different from mine. And, of course, since you've retired from Parliament, you are now working yourself as a lobbyist for a commercial uh, no, law firm in lobbyist. Brussels, no. or as an advisor to a, to a lobbying firm. So, um, I advise them about transparency. Um, and so the point uh, that I want to connect to what, from what Anais has said is that, in my experience, the information from the trilogue is extremely important for anybody who wants to influence the legislative process and that is one reason why when Greenpeace for example is in following legislation on car emissions or on uh, energy etc we want to use that information in order to provide you know to contact the people who are involved so we would want to meet with these people and I believe that's what the vast majority of lobbyists are doing so I just wanted to bring that perspective so that your particular experience uh, also gets enriched with some other perspective on, on to the extent that people involved in trilogues are being lobbied. Thank, thank you. Maybe not so aggressively because good lobbyists do not come across as aggressive. <laughs> um, Malcolm, would you like to just uh, respond quickly or are you, do you feel like you've had your say on, uh, on lobbying? Um, well, I mean, I, we're, now, we're now opening up a whole different area, but... Um, just to say I'm, a, I'm extremely clear in my work that I do with Cabinet DN, whom I'm a policy advisor, that I do not lobby on behalf of their clients because I have no intention of moving from one to another. Um, on the other hand, I think it's valuable basically to have the sort of discussion we're having to explain to people about how the process works. Um, and, you know, that's, that's available to anybody, and I'm very keen to be transparent about that. Um, that's why I've given lectures about some of the points that I made today, and uh, I will submit some material to the, to the Ombudsman as well, and you can even see my 40-minute lecture on the, um, I think it's on YouTube somewhere, on the University of Birmingham website, but I don't necessarily recommend you watch all of it. Um, but, I mean, I think 
I mean, but I do just come back to the point I made, though, in terms of, 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 of quality and outcomes of legislation. It is terribly important to have uh, and listen to the maximum number of points of view that you can in making up and making balanced decisions. Uh, and in the end, that's what, what politics is all about here. Um, and I think, um, and, I, and, and we need to make the process as transparent as, as possible because people have, need to have confidence in it. But I mean, but the real difficulty, I think, in, in the whole of the European decision-making process and co-decision, uh, and I come back to what I said at the very beginning, um, is that it's politicians negotiating with diplomats. You know, I didn't negotiate with Brian Hayes when he was minister. Um, I negotiated with a very skillful Irish, Irish diplomat who was president of the council here and was responsible for that. Now, um, the council never disagrees in public. I mean, diplomats do not want to disagree in public. Um, that's why it's sometimes difficult to get out uh, of, of the council some of their working group minutes. I don't think there's any problem with releasing those. Uh, I mean, again, you have to have the code for that by looking to see the definitive text and then the footnotes underneath, which decode the letters, and which tells you which member states have objections to that clause and why. I mean, there's a, there's a dense amount of information in those working groups. But I mean, I think it's perfectly reasonable to do that at certain stages and for the council negotiators to let us have that information. And as somebody said, I mean, generally they're pretty much available these days anyway. But, but the essential nature of that, of that discussion, that negotiation, you know, makes it a very different sort of negotiation. In a sense, it's that combination. You have to understand the politics of diplomacy and the politics of parliament at one time. And so a lot of our discussion uh, as should be as negotiators, is to understand the objections that member states have to what parliament wants to do. That's a classic negotiating thing anyway. If you understand the problems that member states have with the proposal and how deep-rooted those objections are, then you can frame compromises to move things forward if you think it's the right thing to do. That's the fundamental process that takes place within a legislative trialogue. Yeah. Vicky, you wanted to just add something, and then... Yeah, just uh, linking back to, to Anais's comment there as well. I think, um, again, what you said of, of, of having very difficult times of getting any information as the process is ongoing, I think it comes back to the fundamental question of whether you see a trialogue as a tool that leads towards a goal, or if it's a goal on its own. And then I'm coming back to, to something Mr. Harbour uh, in terms of jargon didn't like very much the rubber stamping that happens of compromises out of trialogues in Parliament and in Council. I think that's a fundamental question. If you say that trialogues are a, a tool to facilitate an agreement and that you have a proper debate at the end of it in Parliament at Council level, I think that's something very different and then you could have a point in saying, okay, yes, it's an ongoing process and perhaps do we need to put the bar of transparency as high, question mark. But at this point in time, I think a trialogue is a goal on its own and I think that's where a big problem lies. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, any more questions from the floor? <coughs> okay, well, Alberto, would you like to uh, make a comment? Yeah, perhaps a final comment, uh, perhaps looking into the future. Um, trialogues are there to stay. They won't disappear. They might change a little bit. I see two major dynamics uh, that might somehow shape the way in which trialogues are going to be organized and they're going to be shaped of the future. Certainly, it's not going to be public opinion uh, to change trialogues, to change their transparency or their accountability. But the institutionalization that we're witnessing right now might lead to an expectation for more transparency and for a better link between the few actors who are involved in the trialogues, the plenary, the committee, and possibly the overall uh, public. I think the crucial issue, legally speaking, is really about when this document should be released. It is pretty clear that this is the issue that will be discussed uh, at the level, possibly, of this open investigation um, or own inquiry. At the same time, it will be possibly uh, ended up in front of the Court of Justice. And the answer to the question on when will possibly be uh, shaped by our own understanding of what the trial should be and the balance between the formal and, and the informality. The other dynamic I see is better regulation. And the proposal for interinstitutional agreement on better regulation is clearly injecting institutional mechanisms that might somehow strengthen the formalization of, 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 the, of the trialogues. 
having the Council and the Parliament doing impact assessment on the amendments will inevitably change uh, the ball game within the trilogue. It will be slightly less political and possibly more evidence-based into the process. And this might open up an entire um, entry for civil society organizations interested in mobilizing as much as they can the public in order to have an entry on those particular points. Thank you, Alberta. So I think we should have a quick look at what things should be kept secret, when they should be published, and some thoughts on the new better regulation agenda. And uh, Yoga, I think we'll start with you. I don't think anything should be kept secret. I mean, the, the essential things should be public. Who's meeting, when, what are they discussing, and what is the outcome? And I think Vicky made an extremely important point there, saying that at the moment where trilogues are not just clarifying points for then having still broad debates in council and parliament, but rather where trilogue is defining 99.9% .9 or 100% of what the outcome will be, uh, it needs to be fully transparent. And Alberto made the comment then the rules that apply to the legislative process must be fully applied to the trilogue because it is de facto now a new type of legislative process that is replacing uh, uh, the, the more well-known and the more transparent uh, two readings, etc. process. So no, no justification to keep trilogues as secretive as they are now. Council is the first one that has to open up. Commission has to the role of the Commission has to be reviewed and uh, the public really needs to know, but, and I want to really stress this, because, again, the trilogue, the crucial thing is when does it come? The f trilogue so early on in the process is a problem in itself, even if it was fully transparent. So, Vicky, do you think that the European citizen really needs to have this transparency? Do you think that the normal European citizen actually cares about trilogues? Well, I wouldn't go as far as to invite European citizens to read a four-column document. That may, as you indicated very rightly, be complicated. But I think it's a question of, of, of perception a lot. I think the perception is, at this point in time, not very much in favour of the EU. And I think, unfortunately, by having processes such as trilogues, which citizens just across the board may not really have any idea what they're about, the perception is not positive. And I think that just increases, as I also briefly mentioned in the beginning in a comment here, it just increases the gap. It does nothing to uh, close the gap. Um, I think it, it is a tool that, that, is, uh, that is used to quite simply demonstrate that the EU is in a capacity to legislate, but I do not believe at this point in time it's a tool of which people say, this is something that makes me provide more confidence in the way the EU does things. And, and if I may, just linking it up to an earlier uh, question you raised, what about better regulation? I, I'm afraid to say that if you see what is in the better regulation, or I would say in the draft interinstitutional agreement, uh, what is put there in terms of trilogues, there's two things essentially. It says an appropriate degree of transparency. I don't think there is any vaguer formulation than that. So I would, given that the text is on the table, invite to at least change or make some changes there. The text is there, so it's up for discussion as we speak. And the second point that is very clearly coming through in that uh, draft interinstitutional agreement is that the Commission, because they have drafted it, uh, evidently as always, they're motivating to advance, as Jorgo said, the trilogue or tripartite discussions even further in time. And then I couldn't agree more with Jorgo there that also on those more advanced tripartite meetings, when possibly discussions in Parliament and discussions in Council Working Group and Core Repair haven't finalised yet, that also those would become fully communicated uh, that the planning would become available on that and that it would be some kind of transparency also that they are taking place at an even earlier stage than I would say regular trilogues in between speech marks. Malcolm, do you think that trilogues can contribute to a bad public image of the EU and EU lawmaking? Well, I don't think so. Um, uh, primarily because I don't think the public understands EU lawmaking anyway. So I think you're talking about the fine detail of a process that's not generally understood. Uh, 
But, but I mean, and in, in a way, but I'm sorry to interrupt you, Malcolm. No. But that's that's the sort of comment which we do sometimes here in Brussels, yeah. and it's it's also the sort of comment which leads to people thinking that yeah. Brussels policymakers are a little out of touch. Well, I agree. And but I was just going on. What I was just going on to say is that I think the real value of making trilogues more apparent is that people, um, that citizens, will understand that their governments are directly involved in making EU legislation. Because that's, that is the face of point. Uh, I think if you went, and, and, and this is part of the, the, the problem that we have to, in presenting this, if I went to a meeting um, and said to people, you know, are you aware that your government is working day to day in Brussels uh, with the Parliament on, in approving European legislation? We have an institution called the Council very exciting and self-explanatory term um, that is working every day um, on your behalf. Uh, you as citizens, the government is sending people, your government is sending people to work on legislation. The interface point is actually the trilogue, and, and in a way we should be using that, if we made it more transparent and more understandable, uh, to say it's not just the European Parliament that's involved in this, it's governments as well. Um, and how often do we see things reported in, in papers, and certainly in my country, are of amendments that are proposed for European legislation by parliamentarians, which then appear as a headline. So, you know, Brussels wants us to do this, where it's only an amendment proposed by a member of the European Parliament, uh, which, of course, never sees the light of day in the end. So, I mean, I think that that's why it's important to get this trilogue process more transparent and, more exp and, and explained more about what it's all about. It's about that interface. The second point I would make, though, is that I agree entirely with both Yoga and with Vicky in particular, that, I mean, I think that trilogues are fundamentally unsuitable for determining disagreements on basic principles of legislation. They were never designed to do that. What they were designed to do was, after we've been through the, the process of the two sides in a lot of detail, was then to act, actually produce this into a form and a workable and effective form that could go forward and deliver the benefits that people basically shared between them. And that's why we need a much earlier engagement, and it will obviously be an informal one, but between the member states negotiators and members of the committee working on it. Because as I said earlier, there are so many ways in which we could revolve some of the technical details without compromising our political principles. Um, if we were enabled to do that. And that means a change of mindset by the council to do that. Uh, and then my other point, I just emphasize this yet again, is, is a lot of the problem is that we're not getting political actors, uh, stakeholders, expert groups, NGOs, engaged early enough in the process of reshaping future legislation. I mean, in most cases, Legislation that's produced by the European Commission as their right of initiative is no secret because of what's gone before it. And Parliament needs to be uh, acting and engaged with that process much further up front than it has been historically because that then gives us an opportunity of having a real and engaged dialogue. What we're talking about now is when we get to the final stages of the process. Now, if we've done the better job up front... We shouldn't have to be so concerned about a lot of the details. We should be aware of what's going on. But the really big picture issues that citizens are concerned about would have been determined with the engagement of their governments, uh, ministers, their own national parliaments, who would understand exactly what is being developed. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, just before we finish, I'm going to ask each of our panel uh, a very simple question, and then I'm going to ask you the same question, and then... Would you like uh, to have a, a final word? Super. So the question is, does the system of trilogues need reform? Yoga? Yes. 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 Yes, but not necessarily through an institutional modification. We can actually make it happen right now on the basis of what we have. And um, I'd like to also put that to uh, uh, a vote. So everyone who is in favour of trilogue reform, please raise your hands. Uh, so that seems a pretty, pretty convincing majority. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to thank you all for coming here and thank the panellists for their insight and uh, the people who ask questions. 
And um, thank you very much, and I'll hand over to the Ombudsman. Thank you very much indeed, James, and thank you all very much, the panellists and, and uh, the audience, for, um, I think, uh, a, a debate and a discussion that was very illuminating and that is certainly going to help me as I go forward with uh, my inquiry into the transparency um, of, of trialogues. But, of course, we very quickly moved on from the issue of transparency, and I think at the point uh, uh, when uh, Malcolm said that you cannot... Uh, uh, separate out transparency from the political process. Uh, I mean, I think that's very clear. I'm just dealing with transparency, but I would be naive uh, to think that the fallout from that doesn't or can't have an impact on the political process. I think we need to step back and see why, why we're doing this, go back to first principles. Um, I, I don't think the EDPS app is going to um, break the Internet, um, but I think the, the outcome of uh, that particular proposal in relation to data protection is certainly going to have an impact on, on people's lives. And we want to make sure that when they see the impact of that, that they will know how that came about. And it is making that uh, connection between the citizen uh, and, and the legislation and the legislative process that that is, that is very critical. I think there were a lot of things that, that came up. Uh, um, I think there was general agreement that basic information in relation to calendars, agendas, all of that should certainly be made available. Uh, and there's no reason why that can't be at this point. Uh, Brian Hayes uh, and a number of other people raised the idea of, of, of green papers, which at least people would know the, the starting point and, and be able to interact at a very, at a very early level. Um, a lot of talk about the Council and uh, transparency of the Council and the need to get uh, uh, member states, uh, increased member states' involvement at, at domestic parliamentary level. I think Malcolm again uh, pointed out to the fact that uh, it's in the Council's interest not to let the fissures or the gaps or the arguments between member states uh, arise, but at the same time, I would imagine that if a citizen in any of the member states asked to know what a member state position was in relation to a particular legislative proposal, uh, proposal then, then the member state government would, would, have, to, would have to tell them. Um, I think Vicky also made a very good point in relation to the quality of legislation and, and whether the process enables um, high-quality legislation in, in, all, in all instances. Um, and then Carl from Transparency International made a very good point in relation to um, even though it, it would seem that information can be very difficult to access, that in fact if you're a well-resourced insider, uh, he says it's relatively easy to do that. And I suppose what transparency does and is supposed to do is even up an unbalanced power equation as between those insiders and the outsiders who in far too many cases are the European uh, citizens themselves. There's also some discussion about where the better regulation uh, agenda um, fits into it and, uh, and all of that. So um, I'm looking forward to continuing with, with your help, uh, certainly when the public consultation kicks off, my inquiry into this. And I suppose if I look at the other strategic investigations that my office is, is dealing with at the moment, whether looking at the transparency register, revolving doors, lobbying, uh, the degree to which contacts with lobbyists are made known at, at relatively lower or, or middle levels within the Commission and other institutions, you can see that it all revolves around uh, a central uh, issue, a central point, and that is influence who is influencing the making of legislation in the institutions. And we have to make sure that that is visible and that European citizens can exercise their democratic and their treaty rights uh, to be as involved as everybody else as the legislation um, uh, is, is being, uh, is, is being uh, put together and, and subsequently enacted. Uh, so I thank you all for your attention. Uh, have a, have a good, uh, good lunch. And uh, thank you very much indeed to James and to the panel for, and for, uh, for their great contribution this morning. Morning. Thank you all very much indeed. I just downloaded the app. It's fantastic. Thank you. Have we had this app available? It's very good. You see, there's no reason why it shouldn't be done centrally and with everything, you know? This is over my objections. I just downloaded it. I just Thank you very much, folks. That was great. Yeah. 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 Ye